Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. This is the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and today we're talking about teaching piano articulation. You can find the accompanying article to go along with this episode at colorfulkeys.ie slash 161 or if you're a member, vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 161. Well, hey there, beautiful teachers. Welcome to another episode of the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm delighted you're here. And you're going to be joining me to talk about articulation. What an exciting topic. But it actually is an exciting topic, right? It just isn't a very exciting sounding word. But articulation is what allows us to bring so much of music to life. We talk, I feel, so much about dynamics and expression and these kinds of things. But really the technique, the articulation, is a huge amount of what makes beautiful piano playing. Am I right? Do you agree with me? I think so. But to students, it can definitely be something quite challenging, and it feels like another series of dots and lines and curves and bits and bobs that they need to sort through. So if you've been struggling to teach this or to help students see the value of it, you're not alone, and we're going to go through it all today and unpack the whole articulation area. We're going to split this episode sort of into three parts. I call them the how, the what, and the where. So we're going to start with how. Step by step, how should you actually teach articulation in a way that sticks with your students and produces great results? I'm going to go through a step-by-step process here for actually teaching the articulation, like what you would do in a lesson the first time you introduce a new articulation. This is not meant to be a prescription. As always, I believe in variety within teachers' methodologies. I'm not here to say this is the correct way. But if you struggle to introduce articulation in an efficient way that gets results, this is a good process to follow, and you can always stray from it later as you get more comfy with it. Try this out. So there are just a few steps here. There's five steps. And the first step with your student is to have them listen. So this is where you're going to demonstrate the articulation in a simple example. I like to choose a section of their piece or an excerpt from the piece where the articulation is about to occur. So this is before they've looked at it, right? So let's say staccato is coming up. They haven't looked at it yet. They've never seen those little dots. And you know that this important piece that introduces staccato for the first time is about to come up. So take a short part of that and play it for your student, or take the whole thing if it's a very short piece. But before you start playing, ask them to close their eyes. Really, really important that they close their eyes, because it's going to focus their attention on the actual sound that you're creating. It really does make a difference. Just close their eyes and listen, and you can repeat it a few times for them. I'm not going to even ask any questions at this stage. We're not going to talk about what it sounds like, just going to demonstrate it for them. The next step is miming. So this is where we start to work on the movement. And I like to do this completely away from the piano. So we focused on the sound first, but now we're taking it away from the music and focus on the movement. It's almost like we've separated them in two. And the reason we do this is, or I'm encouraging you to try doing this, is because, yes, the sound is important, that is paramount. But when students apply the articulation to the piano, or apply anything at the piano, a lot of them, their first instinct is to try and get the right notes. And that's going to be top of mind. That's all they'll really, really care about, is getting those correct notes. Maybe also the correct rhythm, if we're lucky. But they'll think of this as being secondary once you put notes in place. And so starting with just miming the movement is really useful for putting that front and center. So you can do the articulation. Let's say it's staccato throughout here, but this could apply to anything, right? You can do it on air piano or 
on a hard surface like a table. I really like a table because it gives them something to tap on, but it's clear that it doesn't matter where you tap on the table, all the sounds are basically the same, right? There's no wrong notes on a table. So have them try out the articulation in a miming version on that table. You do it side by side with them so that they really can mimic and imitate your movement and all the little things that you couldn't even label for them, but them watching you and copying you side by side will get a lot of those little nuances in the movement across. The next step is to mirror. They're still not going to play here. You're going to play now, so it's not silent anymore. There is sound. You're going to play that same excerpt you were doing before, but they are going to continue miming beside you, this time on the surface of the keys. Now, if you just have one piano, that's absolutely fine. Just do it side by side sitting at the piano. If you do have side by side pianos in your studio, do it like that. If you have a separate teaching piano, but it's over the other side of the room, I would actually recommend that you do this sitting side by side because you want to be close together. (laughs) You want to have them be able to really copy what your arm is doing. Now, here's the part where you make it fun. (laughs) Not that it wasn't fun so far, but a good challenge to give your students here is to tell them that if someone were to watch and they somehow couldn't see the keys at all, like we very carefully angled the camera so they can see your hand and the rest of your body, but not the keys, they shouldn't be able to tell who is playing and who is not. They shouldn't be able to tell who's silent and who's making the sound. So that's a good challenge to show them how closely they need to imitate or mirror what you're doing. Next up, they're going to play. So that might sound like a lot of steps prior to them actually trying it out for themselves, but really we're talking about a couple of minutes there, right? Maybe one for if you do a very short section. So whatever it was that they were mirroring, they're now going to play that on their own, repeat it lots of times to get comfy, and Continue demonstrating back and forth. So do a bit of echoing, like you play, I play, you play, I play, so that they can keep adjusting it without you really correcting anything just by demonstrating. And then lastly, last step is for them to describe it. So most of this was done wordlessly. They're experiencing it. They're imitating. They don't need words to put on to what we're doing. They're just trying to recreate what you're doing in terms of movement and sound. And now you ask them, okay, so how does this sound different to things you've played before? Or how does this sound even? And get them to describe both the sound and the movement. And you can tell them what it's called now. It's called staccato. So how does staccato sound? How did you move to create that sound? And then Once they've gotten a description that they seem settled on, that does make some sense, even if it's not the way you might have described it, write that down on a post-it and stick it on the piece that they're going to work on staccato in. It's in their words. Yes, if they say, I don't know, giraffe jumps, you'd be like, what's the giraffe got to do with anything in your head? But you don't say that out loud, you just write down giraffe jumps. And then how they're moving their arm, they say whatever and you write it down in their words. You could describe it more beautifully and more exactly, perhaps, but if you write it down in their words, it's going to mean so much more to them and be much more powerful as a practice tool at home. You can get to the other descriptions and the adjustments later, but for now, it's about them describing how they feel it and how they hear it. So that is the how. Those are your steps. Let's go over them one more time. We listen with our eyes closed, or your student listens with their eyes closed. You both mime it side by side on a tabletop or in the air. Then they mirror with you playing and them just miming. And then they play it, and then they describe it, and you write that down and put it on their piece. So now let's talk about when. And by when I mean in what order. When do we teach what? I went through all of this in our recent episode on general technique stuff, so you can definitely go back and listen to that if you missed it. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I'm just going to run through this in terms of the order I teach the various articulations in. So I start with non-legato, 
That is so that my students feel their arm weight and they learn to move around the keys without collapsing fingertip joints, without poor hand shape, all of those things. We develop that in a non-legato scenario first. Then we go on to legato, but we only do that when a student is really ready. And yeah, that might be a month. It might be several years if we're talking about a young student, especially one who has hypermobility like me or DCD, aka dyspraxia, or often students with ASD or ADD will also have more troubles with movement or just generally they just need a bit more time. They don't have to have a specific diagnosis or a reason for it. So I will wait as long as needed and what defines that for me is when they can play with a round hand shape most of the time. They Their fingertips are not collapsing, their wrists are at a good height and they use their whole arm to support them in their playing. If they can do and consistently do pretty much all of those things, with a margin for error of course, then they're ready for legato. After legato comes staccato and that wouldn't be as long as a of a difference in most cases. And then slurs, which really, if you think about them, are sort of a combination of legato and non-legato or portato playing. Right? That slur ending, it's a similar movement to what we're using in portato playing. It's just a little bit more of it, right? And more wrist movement. But if they can do both of those things, we're putting them together to create that slur action. So I want to make sure that those first three are really solid again before we get to the slurs and the wrist movement and all of that. And then from there, it's looser. So I'll get to the rest of it, of course, but it'll be more as it comes up in repertoire and I'm not as concerned with the sequencing beyond that point. Finally, let's talk about the wear. (laughs) And what I mean by the wear is the actual pieces you're using to reinforce this articulation because it might sound like a lovely dream, but it's definitely a pipe dream and it wouldn't all be that lovely in practice because we'd be out of a job if you could just tell students, oh, staccato goes like this. Here you are. Here's what it looks like on the page. Now do that every time you see those dots. Mm. <laughs> like I say, I think we'd be out of a job fairly sharpish because that could be a short video and be done. And we all know as teachers, it's not about telling a student one thing one time and having them do it forever in perpetuity. So we need lots of opportunities for them to practice these things. And they need to be varied in context. Just reading pieces is a start. But the more varied the context, I believe the stronger a student's understanding of all these different articulation and techniques involved in playing them will be. So rope pieces are fantastic, especially in those beginning stages. And if you're new to rope teaching, we definitely have a lot of articles on that. I know it's not familiar with to everyone who will be listening to this. So definitely look up the Colorful Keys blog or the podcast feed here and you'll see lots of things about rope teachings and rope teaching, rope pieces and the ins and outs of it. But this is a great opportunity to work on articulation because you're not reading at the same time. And so it can give you a lot more brain space to be able to focus on how you're moving and the sounds that you're creating. Another great plane for working on articulation is inside improvisations you do. So anytime you're going to be improvising with your student, try to, especially, well, after the very beginning, Try to include some articulation that they've been working on, right? Specify that it's going to be staccato or that they should use staccato sometimes or something like that, just as an extra added bonus for your improvisation. To take this a step further and for students who need more reinforcement, one exercise I love to do is improvising side by side, doing a duet, an improvised duet and tell them they need to match the articulation that I do. So if I switch at any point to staccato, they need to switch as well, or legato, or this or that, right? You can use this with anything that you need to work on. And it can be lots of different things, or it can be just two. And a variation on this, if you need lots more practice, is to have them do the opposite of what you're doing. For many of my students, the moment when 
all those little dots and squiggles really hit home is when they're composing. So we do composing, we do a big composing project every year at my studio. And when we do that, we tend to leave articulation marks towards the end, along with the dynamics and stuff. That's the sequence we tend to go in. And when we get to that stage, I like to be a bit cryptic, I guess, especially with the first few years of them doing it when they're not familiar with what's about to happen. I have their piece and it's just notes and rhythms. And maybe we've set a tempo mark. And I say to them, okay, is there anything missing on this piece? And most of them say, no, I think it's done. I say, hmm, okay. I'm going to pretend that I'm not your teacher and that I've received this piece in a book and I'm going to play it. This is how I might play it. And I play it with what I know is the opposite of all the dynamics and the opposite of all the articulation that they want and at the wrong tempo if they haven't said that yet. And then I do it another totally different way, and another totally different way. And this is the moment when all of those annoying markings that they think should be invisible and don't matter on their score, and it's just what their teacher tells them to do, this is when all those things come to life. And they say, "Uh aha, when you're on the other side of this equation, when you're the composer, and you don't want someone to ruin your piece, (laughs) you need to be clear. And therefore, when you're the performer, you need to follow what the composer has said. So this is a lesson that starts to sink in really well from composing projects, and I love them for that. And then lastly, when you are working on repertoire, and it has certain articulation, especially if it's a particular favorite piece of theirs, or something they're leaving on their anytime, anywhere, anyone list or their warm-up list. If it's something they're playing regularly, have them mess around with different versions of it. You could even have them notate the different versions so they could write it out on blank manuscript by hand or they could be using music notation software if you like and have them write out a version where all the articulation is swapped or that's all staccato or with accents in weird parts of the bars, right? Try all different sorts of versions and experiment with the effect that it has on their music. So that is the where and the what or what order and the how of articulation for me, from my perspective anyway. And I'd love to hear your perspective. Let me know what you think about this topic in the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers group on Facebook or on the comments for this episode, either at colorfulkeys.ie 161 or vibrantmusicteaching.com 161 if you're a member. I'll see you there. If you liked this episode, you would absolutely love Vibrant Music Teaching membership. We have the support and the training you need to take your teaching further. Join us today by going to vmt.ninja and signing up.